So, um, my name is Shakti Butler, and it really is a pleasure for me to be here with you this morning. I am a filmmaker and a lecturer. I teach all over the world talking about race, and often in places where people don't have language for race. It's kind of hard to believe when you live in the United States, but even though the same phenomenon repeats itself again and again, uh, there are a lot of ways that we don't talk. So, one of the ideas of this film that I made Cracking the Codes is to be able to support us in talking, but not just talking. Being able to understand race, which is something that's constructed, but the impact is very powerful. That it's part of a system, and you'll learn about the system, and we'll go through the system, and you'll talk to each other. Hopefully, the purpose of us being here together today is that it's the beginning of a conversation. So I'm going to share with you the first time I noticed race. And so I can tell you a little bit about myself. So um, <clears throat> I grew up in Harlem, in New York City, the daughter of a West Indian man and a Russian woman. My father was from Barbados. My grandmother on his side was full Arawak Indian. And my parents met. And when my parents married, which was in 1945, my father was 21 years older than my mother. And when they married, her family disowned her. In fact, my grandfather, who died when I was three, never knew that my mother was married or had a child because he had a bad heart and they thought it would kill him. That's deep, huh? So I am your walking secret. And <clears throat> because my father was 21 years older than my mother, that means that he was born in 1890. My father's father was a slave in Texas, in Austin, Texas. I am a, obviously, very light-skinned African-American woman who grew up at a time where it didn't matter how fair you were. Whatever your shade, you were black. That's, that's how the system kind of works. And so culturally speaking, because that's where I was held and that's where I was nurtured. That's how I identify. So when I was little, I went to all black schools. And when I went to the little brown schoolhouse and school on the hill and all of that, when I got to the third grade, my parents decided they wanted me to have a better, what? Education. So where did I go? I went to a private school. And in that school, I was the only person of color from the third grade through the eighth grade. And that's when I noticed. Because I had a very different experience when I went home from what happened to me at school every day. And I learned how to seamlessly navigate those worlds. That instilled in me, because I had an understanding, and because I'm so light-skinned, and oftentimes, much more so in California than in New York, quite frankly, people don't necessarily know what I am. And I was taught that when you have access, you have to hold the door open for people who can't get through as easily as you can get through. That I had to be three times better because I was black and a woman in order to be able to achieve. Those things were drummed into me deeply. So understanding and navigating what I've come to understand as a system is what this film is about. It's about how, what, what the system consists of and how it operates. Because we cannot be allies to each other. We cannot make change unless we understand how the system actually works. And so often it's kept at the personal level. He did this to me, or she did that to me, or whatever the case might be. And that so does not touch what the structure is, how it stands. So we're going to start the film in a second. I want to ask you one question. Think about your body as the human system. What is the job of your body? 
What is the function of the human system? Hmm? It's not a trick question. What, is your, what does your body do? If you get hurt, what does your body do? It addresses it. If you stub your toe, you, you might get a headache, right? But your body is working to bring things back into what? Into balance to keep it going. The job of the system is to keep itself alive. So the job of the system of racialization, I use that word because it's a noun, meaning it's constantly changing. It's constantly changing. And we have to understand what it's composed of if we're gonna make solid interventions, both internally and externally. So when the movie comes on, it's in three sections. During the film, you'll hear places where a chime is ringing. That's just for your own silent reflection. And when the flag comes up, we're gonna actually stop. <coughs> and you'll have a chance to talk to each other. I'm gonna ask you to watch the film in a very specific kind of way, because most of us, when we go to the movies, we go to be what? Entertained, so this is not entertainment. This is for you to pay attention, to notice what pulls you in. What triggers you? What makes you push away? Because those responses to what you see really are doorways to transformation. Your own and your ability to engender it in others. Does that make sense? What we notice is related to who we are, what our experiences have been. And we have as many different experiences of walking through this world as we have people. I've one more thing I want to say, which is I want to talk to you just for a moment about the human brain. And I want to talk to you about how the brain functions. We, as human beings, are only taking in about 2% of the data that's constantly streaming our way. 2%. But we all think we know, don't we? I mean, quite frankly, if the world worked the way you thought it should, everything would be okay people should just get it together. But in fact, we're seeing very, very different things. We're interpreting what we see very differently. And so it behooves us to be very curious about somebody else's perspective, even if they're making you really, really angry. And I'm not suggesting you have to talk to everybody. But there's some process going on in there that has created that worldview for that person. So you ready? Okay, so we're gonna start um, the first part and enjoy. My sister-in-law, uh, who's half black, half white, but looks white, blue eyes, whiter than most white folks, very white. Uh, she and I, you know, we kind of grew up together. We raised our children together. Uh, so they're first cousins and we, you know, it's the wonderful, very, very multicultural family. So we're going in a safe way one day. And um, Kathleen, my, my sister-in-law, is in front of me. And she's, uh, you know, writing a check for her groceries. Now, my daughter, who at the time was 10 years old, was standing with me. And I was directly behind her, you know, getting ready to get my groceries. So Kathleen comes up. And the checker, who is a strawberry blonde, um, freckled, very delightful, warm, um, you know, the checker, this young woman, is talking to Kathleen. Hey, how you doing? Isn't it a nice day today? They're just chatting up. And she says, yes. Yeah. So Kathy writes her, her check, and she steps off to the side with her groceries because she's waiting for me. Of course, again, Kathleen looks white, right? So I come up. No conversation. She looks up at me. Absolutely no just little chatter. And uh, I write my check. My daughter, however, is 10, notices immediately the difference in how she responds to me. So I write my check, and she goes, I'm going to need two pieces of ID. At which point, my daughter looks at me, and she gets very, very embarrassed, and tears are, are, are kind of coming up in her eye, like, Mommy, you're not going to let her do this. Why is she doing this to us, right? So I'm trying to figure out what I should do, because behind me are two elderly white women, right? And I'm thinking, OK, so then I become the angry black woman, right? And they're going to be. And I just, I'm, I'm just trying to second guess all the drama. So then I, I just give her the two pieces of ID. I said, you know, some things you got to choose your battles, right? And then it gets worse. She pulls out the bad check 
book, right? So the, this is the book that shows the people who have written bad checks. So she starts searching for my license in the bad checks, at which point it's just out of control now. Just as I'm standing there um, trying to decide what to do, and it's really deeply humiliating, now my, my daughter is in full-blown emotionally upset, who's 10, my sister-in-law walks back over. And she steps in and she says, excuse me, why are you doing this? And the checker goes, well, what, what, do you, what do you mean? She goes, why are you taking her through all of these changes? Why are you doing that? She goes, well, um, this is our policy. She goes, no, it's not your policy because you didn't do that with me. Oh, well, I know you, you've been. She goes, no, no, she's been here for years. I've only lived here for three months. And so at this point, the two white elderly ladies go, oh, I can't believe what this checker has done with this woman. It is totally unacceptable. At which point, the manager walks over. So the manager walks over and says, is there a problem here? And then my sister-in-law again responds. She goes, yes, there is a problem here. Here is what happened. So you see, she used her white privilege. And even though Kathleen is half black and half white, she recognizes what that means. And she made the statement. She pointed out the injustice. And she, as a result of that one act, influenced everyone in that space. But what would have happened? I can't know for certain had the black woman said, this is unfair. Why are you doing this to me? Would it have had the same impact? But Kathleen knew that she walked through the world differently than I did. And she used her white privilege to educate and make right a situation that was wrong. That's what you can do every single day. So whether you talked about this first section or not, and welcome to those of you who just came in, we're watching a film that is in three parts that's looking at the system of racialization, how it's actually structured, how it's set up. And that system is something that we need to understand if we have any chance of trying to build a world that works for everybody, a place where everyone has an opportunity to thrive. And um, we just looked at the first section, which is looking at history, culture, and identity, understanding that the system is embedded in the historical pathways that have been set, and that that history informs culture, and that culture informs how we identify, and that the system is actually moved by power and economics. We very rarely have conversations, necessarily, about power and economics and how the confluence of being able to exert your will over a group of other people for your own benefit is really what drives the system. It's what forces the system to stay alive because that balance of holding that power and economic gain is always at work. Um, the other day I was in the AT&T store and I was talking to a young sister who was working in there and she was we were talking about, I said, well, you know, how do you like working here? She said, it's okay. People are nice. I said, well, how do they treat you as employees? What do you think she said? Not that great. Every time there's a shift in the commission structure or whatever, it's always taking a little bit of money out of the employees' pockets, the ones who are on the front lines get paid the least. And what that actually means is that those dollars are actually going to ensure the profit-making capacity of the organization. This is without saying there are good people and bad people. I'm saying the system is set up to ensure that those people who have the ability to make decisions that will benefit them will make those decisions. So that's the system history, identity, culture, moved by power and economics. Now we're gonna look at what are the internal components of the system. How does that history, culture, and identity impact us? Us, I mean everybody. There is bias, which is both conscious and unconscious. There's privilege, which everyone should have. And there's internalized racialization those places where we've absorbed the messages about who we are and where we belong, that we're either aware of or not aware of, that we're either resisting or succumbing to, or anything in between. So this section, I'm asking you to really pay attention to what you notice in two ways. One, what stands out for you, and two, what might be something that you hear that you've never considered before. 
you never really thought about it. Maybe you were never even ever aware of it because that information is really valuable in the same way that you learn about yourself is also valuable. Okay, so you ready? Okay. I grew up in um, Washington, D.C., later named Chocolate City, um, and the experience of growing up in Washington, D.C., See, in southeast Washington, which is right on the Maryland, D.C. border, um, with um, poor white people on the Maryland border and uh, working black folks on the D.C. side, was pretty um, crucial in laying the foundation for my understanding of humanity, not just of race. As a child, uh, as most children are, I was really inquisitive. And so I knew that when I went to Northwest Washington, D.C., where the Capitol, the Monument, and the White House were located, that there was a different quality of life for the people who matriculated that area. And then right down the street almost, on T Street in Northwest, where my grandmother and grandfather lived, it was not that way. I mean, they had their own home. but directly opposite the street they were on, people lived in abject poverty. And in the wintertime, um, as I got older, I was saddened and horrified to think about what people did in the cold winter if they didn't have heat, and many of them didn't. Mill Valley is a primarily white town um, that is definitely uh, practices the ethos of colorblindness, is what I would call it now. Um, it's one of those places that uh, you know, it is, it is very white and a lot of the white folks there uh, purport not to see race. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a, it's seen as a, as a benevolent gesture to not notice one's race. Color became part of the conversation when I asked my mother, why is it like this? And she said to me simply, sugar, white folks have set it up like this. And I'm thinking about the white children and the white families I knew. They were too poor to set anything up. And I, and I asked her, because they were in the same situation I, I felt that we were in. And they really are. And I asked her to explain it. And she said, well, you know, I, you know, I grew up in the South, she said. I said, yes. And she said, you know, I was there when the Ku Klux Klan uh, ran the show in North Carolina, and but before that, there was, you know, the, it, the it, black people couldn't eat in a restaurant where other, where she would say, the other people ate. What other people are you talking about? She would almost censor herself for me, and uh, I thought, oh, there's a lot here, and then she explained slavery, slavery to me. And I remember I was really, you know, like in elementary school, and she described slavery, that people, human beings, were slaves. And I didn't understand what she meant, so I asked her to explain that. What, what do you mean? They had them to do a lot of chores because she had us doing a lot of chores at home. But I knew that wasn't what she meant, but I wanted to, what do I compare this to? She said, oh, no, sugar, uh-uh. They couldn't be married. They couldn't keep their children. They didn't have their own souls. Everything was taken from them. And you know, your grandfather, she meant her father. His father was a slave. I said, no way. She said, yeah, that's why he has that African name, Osi. I said, well, why did the people let themselves be slaves? And she said, oh, Erica, it wasn't like that. The whole government supported it. I had gone to Mississippi because I learned about this relative that I had who was a distant relative, but also one that I hadn't heard about until college, um, which I found telling um, about my own family, about what colorblind racial ideology is, um, because he was the governor of Mississippi um, from 1956 to 1960. Um, and so the moment that I remember, I guess, is, is being in the archives in Mississippi, right, on this research fellowship and, and reading these letters that he wrote, um, 
mind you, he was elected into office um, four months after Brown II. And um, one of the first things he did was set up the State Sovereignty Commission and sort of be in cahoots with the Citizens Council um, and try to use the law to um, preserve Mississippi's way of life, right? So to, to subvert Brown through a-racial, legalistic means. But it wasn't until I read about the horrors of slavery, equal to, if not worse than, the Nazi Holocaust against the Jewish people, that I got angry. When I saw that this had gone on for centuries, not just a period of time related to a war, and that the government had sanctioned it, that the Pope at the time had sanctioned it. I became angry. In the archives, I was reading this letter uh, of this, this guy, J.P. Coleman, um, my grandmother's sister's husband, so distant. But um, it was this letter that, to me, echoed of a sort of Ward Connerly colorblind um, approach to the law um, as a way to um, ensure that, that racialized hierarchies of power uh, continue and are upheld. Um, and the letter was, was basically one of, you know, in, in 1956, Mississippi, um, looking to remove the language of race from the law uh, so as to maintain segregated schools. But right up until I began reading and reading and reading and reading, and I wasn't reading, you know, just, I was reading history that I could find that wasn't telling lies. And that's the other thing that made me angry. No one had ever told me in school. No one had ever told me the truth. They taught me about Crispus Attucks. Okay, you know I don't have anything against Crispus Attucks, but I needed to know more than the black men who fought in the American Revolution, you know? But I didn't get the truth. I was told a watered down story, watered down story about uh, Native Americans, and I watched TV shows that showed Native peoples as savages that didn't speak any language um, that was discernible. African people that had bones through their noses and had no language except ooga booga. When I realized that this is what not only I was taught, but all of the nation's children and people were being taught this, I was so pissed off. The civil rights movement is easy to reduce if it's only Mississippi goddamn, if it's only, um, you know, sort of the, the dogs and fire hoses, Bull Connor bigotry. Um, it's easier to say that's not here anymore. We can't point to that, even though we can't sometimes. But um, I think that that monolithic story is something that needs to be looked at, something that I think a lot of scholars look at, but something that looking at my great grand uncle's story, it makes it more complex because Mississippi wasn't all, you know, sort of a rabid dogs and fire hoses bigotry. It was also um, sort of sly, um, purportedly colorblind, um, legalistic racism. And I think that so often we talk about the interpersonal when it comes to race, um, when we need to be talking about the structural also. On the racism side, what I witnessed with my dad in particular was someone who was uh, very disturbed by racism. Someone who was very, he's very dark skinned, a dark skinned Mexican man who hated being dark skinned. At the same time, there was tremendous pride in being Mexican. There was tremendous pride in being brown. My grandfather was a revolutionary in Mexico, and there's a lot of pride about him having been a revolutionary and fighting for the rights of the poor, right? So there's, there's this passion about revolution. There's this passion about liberation that lives inside. At the same time, there's that embarrassment about being dark. I saw myself as ugly for many years because culturally I was not light-complected. I have 
have lips that are not thin, I have kinky hair, I have all of those things that the society at large, but in a way that has been internalized by my own community, and it is not something that was overt in my household because that is not so, but I had somehow taken on and acculturated myself to the expectations of society about what I was supposed to be. The most staggering piece truly about getting working on my own internalized depression had to do with a dinner. I think it was a Thanksgiving dinner in which we were telling these stories about the ways in which my grandmother chastised my mother's generation. And it was clear to me in the telling of the stories, it still makes me cry, that she was both emotionally and physically abusive. Not because this was her intention, she was doing the best that she knew, but the expectation that she had of her children was absolute, unquestioning, immediate obedience. I remember about 10 years ago, and I'm 54, so this wasn't that long ago. 10 years ago, he was visiting, and he showed me a picture of himself when he was four years old. I had never seen pictures of him when he was young before. He never showed any photos of, of himself to us. And he showed me this picture. Uh, he was four years old. He showed me laid this picture on. He says, look at this. I look at the picture, and it's this cute, beautiful four-year-old boy, dark, dark, dark. And then they lived in the desert. They're even darker, right? So they lived out there in the desert dark picture of this four-year-old, cute four-year-old, and I said, Dad, oh, you're so cute. How come you haven't shown me these pictures before? This is the first time I've seen them. And he said, well, look at it. And I looked at it, and he says, I look like a goddamn piece of charcoal. One day when my daughter, who's my oldest child, age 12, did something, talked back in a way that was inappropriate. It was really inappropriate, but she was at that stage of her own development that she was self-actualizing and I needed to make some room. And I said to her, in a tone that I don't know if I can quite capture, but I said, who do you think you are? And the intent was to stop her, but there was an unspoken expectation in the way that that question was answered that she was gonna say nobody. And that, that was the telling point when I knew that there is something here that has to be unpacked and I have to do it not for the world. I have to do this so that my own family can survive and there can be a healing inside of my family because if I can't do that, then there's nothing I can do in the world. So as I began to unpack the source of these behaviors, not just for my family but for other families because we weren't the only people that were telling these amusing stories at Thanksgiving, I began to look at why we engaged these and other behaviors, and they really had to do with survival. There were periods in the history of this country, particularly during slavery, in which one's life depended upon how well you could say, yes, sir, how convincingly you could ingratiate yourself, and how high you could jump when told to jump. And my grandmother, grew up in a time where lynching was a reality. You know, nobody talked about it in the past tense. Nobody talked about it as electronic. It was the real deal. There were ropes and torture involved. And raising your children to know their place was critical. And had there been a shift by the time my mother and her brothers and sisters were born from my, my grandmother's time, certainly. And had there been a shift from my mother's time to mine, most assuredly. But there were behaviors, survival behaviors, that are embedded in both cultures, both white and black, that support this way of being and maintains a very specific power structure that you have to sit down and think about how you prepare yourself and your children not only to be oppressed, but to be oppressors. So here's the real deal. So you've seen two sections of the film so far. You've seen the environment that has created where we are today. There's a historical trajectory. And it is based in a polarization of black and white with people of color scooped up in the middle. There's a history that we are not taught. There's a culture 
that we don't really know necessarily because we're in it, like the fish swimming in water, we're in the culture. And then we don't necessarily see how it shapes us as individuals. Beyond that, we don't necessarily see how we are disconnected from ourselves, disconnected from each other, and disconnected from the earth. That's how we can treat ourselves and other people and the earth the way we do. And oftentimes, if we don't see ourselves reflected in the story, we think it's not important to us. That's not true either. So where I'm hoping, or what I'm hoping for um, this time that we have together is that you do leave here being curious about something else, asking yourself a new question. Because questions really, the way you, you know, when you're in school, when you get your master's or your PhD or whatever, you spend a lot of time trying to figure out the question. Because the way you ask the question determines what you're going to explore. So if you leave here and you ask yourself some new questions, that's a very powerful thing. Here's the last point. I would bet that almost every single one of you saw something that you remember and that the reason you remember it is because you can relate to it somehow, even if it's a relationship of resistance. Doesn't matter. But once you have that story, your job really is to be able to analyze that story. To be able to say, where is the history in this story? How does history shape the capacity for this story to even happen, right? Where's the culture in this story? And how does it inform me as an individual? And then to be able to go, where's power in economics? Where is the bias and the privilege and the internalized stuff? And all of that. Some of it, of course, is overlapping because it's all happening at the same time. And if we don't really understand how we're pitted against one another, ignoring and not being taught the common history that we share, we can't, we can't stop it. We can't stop it. We don't have a chance of stopping it. And that's why I'm here, because I care about my grandchildren's children and their children. And I want them to walk in a world where they have an opportunity to shine, to be able to be the best that they can be. So it's my responsibility, and it's your responsibility to understand how culture informs how you walk through the world. How the behavior that you have is informed by something that you weren't born with. It has become created. And you either stop it or you perpetuate it or something in between. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? Yes. So um, there's so much I would like to share and be able to actually talk to each and every one of you because I'm fascinated by who we are as the human species. But of course, there's no time for that. Um, we're going to watch the last section of the film, which looks at the external components. The external components, which we rarely get to talk about, unless we're sort of noticing what's going on in what I would call the lies we learn in the news, we aren't necessarily connecting the dots between all of the environmental pieces, the internal pieces, and how they relate to the external pieces and how power and economics are really at play. So are you ready for the last section? Yes. It's gonna explain structure, um, give you, you know, some of you probably already know, but before we begin that, I wanna just share with you one idea about structure, which is we're sitting in a building right now that has a structure. If it didn't have a structure, we couldn't be here, right? So what is in the structure of this building that's on a campus that allows us to be here? You could say it's the chairs to help us sit here, right? The money that has come onto the campus to allow the building to be built. That's one of the reasons we're here. But there's the foundation 
and the wiring and the plumbing and the electricity and the technology. They form a network, all of these things form a network of relationships that come together in a given point in time that allow us to be present, right? So structure is often something we cannot see. And it is this network, that's why creating networks is a way to address power. Networking and creating large networks that are not just cultural networks, but networks across difference, really allow us to create something new. So that's all I'm gonna say about that for right now. But so this section is about structure and how structure operates to perpetuate the system whose job it is to keep racial racialization going. That's its job, is to perpetuate that. It doesn't matter if you're a good person. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're a good person or whether or not you notice race, which is ridiculous, but we're not gonna go there either. So, structure. You know, right now where we are in the world, we really need to work together. And so we have all kinds of folks trying to work together, trying to, to work against this battle or win that battle or, or build this community and break down and dismantle, you know, communities that aren't serving us. But what gets in the way every time is race. There's unconscious bias that's built into our brains because we have really, as human beings, for hundreds and thousands of years, absorbed messages about uh, who belongs at the top of the racial hierarchy and who belongs at the bottom. I was born in Medford, Oregon, and in Medford there were absolutely no people of color within the city limits. So we're 11 years old and I meet another person who then becomes my best friend, and she still is my best friend. And her name was Serena Maria Cruz, right? So Serena, for me, wasn't of color. She was white. So we're graduating, we're, we're, we're signing up for the PSAT, to take the test to, and this is where we've gone to school together for five or six years, and we've been to each other's houses, we've had birthday parties, we're all involved in the same gifted program activities, and, and um, she's filling out her, her form and filling out her race, and, and I'm filling out my form, and I look over at Serena, and I see her filling out the bubble for Hispanic, and so I actually reach out and I grab her hand and I pull it up and I tell her, Serena, you're supposed to fill out the white bubble. And she looks at me and she says, she says, she says, look at me, Susie. She says, look at me, like this. And I looked at her and I didn't have any clue what she was talking about. I didn't know what she was talking about. And um, when I look back now, right, and I think about entitlement. Um, I mean, it's hard for me to even locate where racial entitlement is because everything about my life has been entitlement. When I use the term codes of power, I'm foremost talking about the reality that culture informs everything that we do and that most white people, because we live in a country where we see ourselves all the everywhere in every way and our culture is validated everywhere and in every way we don't understand how our cultural values are brought into the classroom so when a white boy walks in the room we understand him we have similar cultural values we understand how to behave how to talk how to respond to one another if i'm a white woman and he's a white boy. He can see me as his mother. I can see him as my child. That positions him to know not only that he's right in the world, but that he deserves to feel comfortable and that he is really claiming his, play, his rightful place in the world to be a leader. A white boy who walks in the room and is animated and moving around and maybe even a little cheeky is smart. And isn't, isn't he smart? Isn't he cheeky? He's almost looked at as, well, boys will be boys. A child of a boy of color, especially an African-American boy who walks in the room exhibiting the same behavior, 
walks in and it's, hmm, I might need to keep an eye on him. And that, I really believe, is our internalized racism, that we are afraid of these young boys. And I'm talking young boys, four years old and above. And that instead of the teacher looking at him or herself and saying, what is going on with me, that this same behavior uh, creates fear in me instead of admiration, we pathologize the boy of color. I travel all the time. If I'm in an airport, I've seen folks particularly who could be perceived as being from the so-called Middle East, uh, who could be perceived as potentially Arab or, or whatnot, or Persian or anything else. How many times I've seen them pulled aside and searched, and it's not that that fascinates me so much. It's the reaction of the other travelers that I'm looking for, right? It's the reaction of folks looking at them sort of very nervously as opposed to when I'm stopped. Because I travel enough, occasionally I'm going to get searched. Uh, statistically, that's obviously going to happen. And when I am, what's that experience like? And I pay very close attention and no one's looking at me. No one is looking at me with that look of, oh, crap, I really hope that white dude is not on my plane, right? Nobody's really nervous about that. When I think of internalized racism, I think of the appropriation by persons of color of the prejudice, bigotry, and stereotypes which are aimed at them. It's, it's always kind of like climbing up this mountain. Well, maybe if I do this, maybe if I do that. And sometimes not even consciously saying, well, maybe if I do this. It's not like I, I would consciously say, well, maybe if I just made my hair a little straighter, um, I would be more accepted. You start learning, oh, well, you know, if, if I could be more white, you know, then, then I could be more comfortable, then I can fit in better. There would be people that would come into um, the flower shop where my mom worked. I would work in there sometimes during high school. And if there was someone that walked in that was, say, Latino, you know, I might help them last, just like the white people do. I think it's really, as Americans, we still are really not good at seeing a racist impact when there is no apparent racist. We need to uh, really broaden our view so that we can see that if you have had decades, centuries of explicit racism, and then on top of that, you lay seemingly race-neutral rules and policies, you're going to get still uh, a churning out of racial disparities, again, even if no one intended to do that. Because that's the way structural racism works, that history matters. Um, but I really want to thank you for being here. I, I can't tell you, it's, it's, it's part of what keeps me going, is to see that people are really interested in learning, they're interested in exploring something. And um, I would not be doing my job properly. Um, I don't even know if I can say it like that. I don't know if I mean it like that. But if I didn't drive home the point about how important it is to use your own personal stories or the things that you notice to go deeper, to analyze. So I just wanted to give you one example. Somebody tell me one story that stood out for you that you saw. Just one. Yes, ma'am. The grocery store. So that's, just so you know, that's Joy Leary. She is, um, I'm proud to call her my dear friend. You know, when you're a poor filmmaker, you use all your friends to make your movies. That's all I can say. My kids are in the movie, everything. So she, um, you should look her up. She um, wrote a book called Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And that particular story has had over a million hits on the web, so that you picked a good one. But let's look at that story for just a moment, because I want to use story to analyze, okay? So she's telling the story, for those of you who don't uh, get that one, it's the one where she's in the, in the supermarket with her sister-in-law, and her sister-in-law looks white, she's mixed, and she has this interaction with the cashier. The cashier is friendly to the woman she perceives to be white, but less than friendly to Joy. It impacts her daughter. Her daughter's in tears. Um, 
her sister-in-law steps in and challenges what's going on and says, you know, um, this is something that you can do every single day. Fabulous story, right? Let's think about the story. So if you have the diagram of the infinity loop, which if you didn't write it down, you can get it from my web, which is world-trust.org, world-trust.org. That infinity loop is there. And let's look at how it's meant to be used, right? So the infinity loop says that this system of oppression, which by the way, every single form of oppression works the same way. Doesn't matter whether it's race, gender, absolutely. Race, gender, class, queer, whatever it is, it all works the same way. And the object of it is to do the divide and conquer thing. All right? So we say, okay, let's look at the story through the lens of history. What is it in our understanding of history that allows that story to exist? What is it? What are some of the things? Biases. Biases, where do those biases come from? So there are biases in the story. Well, let's just look at the story and call out the, the things that you notice. There are biases in the story. We'll do it that way, it'll be easier. So what biases did you notice in the story? Right. Than she could be other right. So that's bias. And at the same time that the bias is going on with her, what did she use as an excuse for her behavior? What did she say? The rule. Rule, she said. That's the policy. And she got challenged on that. But that's where it goes, right? It goes from this is the bias, and it rests upon the rules. Where did she learn those rules? In, In school, yeah. church neighborhood, parents. She learned the rules. The rules are being taught to us every day. They're both spoken and unspoken, so that's then unconscious bias. She's not even aware of what she did, which is a really hard thing to hold on, because I know when I was growing up, I used to think, everybody sees what they're doing. But I've learned that that's not really true. Yes, sir? That's right, it comes from the organization. And where does some, so look at, so look at that. There's, there's the organization, which is part of the structure. There are the rules, the perceived rules, the biases. Where does all of that come from? Environment. Environment and history, right? Because the way this country was founded, it was founded on take, use, economic advantage. History, the power to enforce those rules that were created even way back then, that then informed science, so-called science. You can see, you can start seeing how the network holds it in place. It's not just because that girl behind that counter is not a nice person or not a good person. It is so much more complex than that. So what happened to her daughter? What happened to Joy's daughter, yes? Right. She observed a white looking woman rescuing, in some ways rescuing the situation. Right. So look at the what is the daughter, what is the daughter learning? And what was the daughter's reaction? She's crying, right? Mommy, you're not gonna. So there is power, that's another kind of power that's being acted out there. And the daughter, this is where the wounding comes in, where you're taught that you're not as good as, or you don't belong, or there's no power, or there's whatever, it's taught. And it's layer after layer after layer after layer. And just to become aware of what it means to analyze what's going on, so you're looking at the complexity of it, gives you a better place to stand when you're trying to interrupt it, right? Now, everybody laughs when they say, when the story says, and the two white women at the end are saying, I can't believe what this woman is doing to this checker. I call it the laughter of relief. Because we need allies. 
We need other people who will step in, not just the sister-in-law, but the supporting environment. And have you ever found yourself in a situation where no one was really supporting you? Maybe your friend, but they're just angry black women because that perception is in there. I want to say one more thing before I um, close this out and then you can ask me some questions if you want. This past Wednesday, I had the opportunity, I'm saying this specifically because I don't know a lot about this campus other than the fact that my son goes here. I don't know a lot about this campus except that I know that there's some black brown struggle going on in this campus. So I'm just, I don't work here so I can be perfectly blunt. I went to um, a lecture on Wednesday in the city, offered by this brother who doesn't live here anymore, he lives in um, Belize. And um, he is a history, history is his thing, and he talked about black brown history. In this case, he was talking about the history of Mexico, which is also in some ways the history of Puerto Rico, but the history and the relationship that if black people and brown people really knew that history, which is not taught to us in school, we would be skipping down the road together, holding hands. Why does attention exist not only on this campus, but in other places? It's about resources, and the perception about resources is in there somewhere. Who's gonna get, who's gonna be left out? Who's in charge, who has power, who's gonna be left out? It is this pitting against one another that also perpetuates the system. And it's very hard sometimes to be the only person in your crew who's going to stand up for what's right. What's right is whether you're black, yellow, brown, white, green, purple, I don't care. We need to come together to fight for justice. I am not a diversity trainer. I am a social justice advocate. What is right is that the perception is there's not enough. It's taught to us on a daily basis. The wealth gap is increasing exponentially. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I would invite you to write down wealth in America, wealth inequity in America, or it might be wealth in America. You can get it on YouTube. It will break that down for you. At the same time, also write down uh, National Geographic 7 billion. So wealth inequality in America and National Geographic 7 billion. We'll, we'll give you more in just a few minutes than I could give you right now. But I'll tell you one thing. If the population of the world is about 7 billion and you have people stand side by side by side, all 7 billion, how much space do you think they would take up? I'll tell you. They would fit side by side in the city of Los Angeles. You go, what? Yes. Seven billion people. And the reason you know that that's true is because there's 12 million people in New York, right? But I'm talking about standing side by side. So there's a perception that there's not enough space. The truth is that large percentages of people don't have adequate plumbing or food all over the world. We, we are being directed to look at garbage on television, to spend all of our time totally involved in ourselves. And what does that mean in the long term? We can't sustain life. So for me, this is no joke. You have to be that voice, or you have to find those other voices to say, you know what? You and I, we need to connect. We may have completely different cultures. You may look at a movie like this and say, that's not about me. But your children will inherit this world. And your children's children will inherit this world. And so will their children. And if we don't take care of each other, we're not going to make it. And if we don't understand how to analyze what's going on, we're not going to make it. And so we have, we have to. We just have to. So I, that's, a, that's all I'm going to say for today. I just um, I want to let you know that there are racial equity learning modules that are free. 
to you. If you're interested in them, you can pass these cards around. Um, our our uh, email address is in the back, info at world-trust.org. Those are multimedia modules. They're three hours long. You can watch parts of them. You can get the movie. You can do all kinds of things to create conversations in your community and to think about it together. And then more importantly, to act on it together. So I give you um, all of my blessings and wish you all well that life carries you down the stream that you want to go and that you be the ones because you've inherited, inherited the mess that people my age and older have created. And it's time for us to really do something about that. So thank you very much. And I'll stay with you. And I'll stay with you. Does anybody have anything? I'm going to come talk to you later about what you asked and as soon as we're done with this. Do you have time? OK. Does anybody want to ask me anything before we go? Anything burning? Yes. We do, so you know, we ha I ha there's a person who works in our office who does social media. I'm embarrassed to say I do know how to do Facebook, but we do have a Facebook page. Um, if you write to my office to World Info Trust, they can give you all of that stuff. I don't really, I'm an old person. That's all I can say. That's my excuse. <laughs> Anything else? So you can, you can stay in touch with us that way. That's it? No questions? You good? Yes, sir. Shakti, S-H-A-K-T-I, last name Butler, B-U-T-L-E-R. I'm starting a new film looking at, um, well, we did one on uh, privilege, mirrors of privilege, making whiteness visible, because that's a phenomenon, it's not about people. And um, I'm starting a new film now looking at the relationship between justice and healing, healing from historical harm. So that will be out in about three years. That's how long it takes. Anything else? So this this film that you're talking about, the privilege. Mirrors of privilege make that's available already. So if you go into my webpage, you'll see all the films, you'll see the conversation guides that go with the film so that you can show them yourselves. You don't need me. And um, and I'm happy to support you in any way that I possibly can. Anything else? I just want to thank you for your to address not so easy issues, mm. um, issues that most people would rather not talk about. Right. Yes. Well, thank you. I, I take that in fully, and I appreciate your being here because my voice by itself means nothing. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you.